Wake up, Skywalker. We need to talk. That's right. Eyes open. You know who I am, right? Sure thing, Red. I've seen the family hollows and the histories they drummed into me. You and the battles you fought were pretty unforgettable. You're Mara Jade Skywalker. Death sticks. These are really stupid. Why do you do this? Keeps me from touching the Force, or the Force from touching me. You're an idiot. You can't stop from touching the Force any more than you can stop breathing. You're a Skywalker. The Force runs strong in your family. Real question is, which way are you going to go with it? I know both sides. I was the Emperor's hand, and I was Luke Skywalker's wife. Partying with both sides of the Force. You knew how to live. I can tell you, keeping with the light can be really tough. The dark side is so seductive, and more addictive than those death sticks. And it calls to you, doesn't it? It calls. Mara Jade Skywalker was a human female roughly 57 years of age at the time of her death. While the exact origins of the human species in the Star Wars universe have been lost to history, the prevailing theory was that they originated on the core world known as Notron, which is actually an archaic name for Coruscant. Though it should be noted that various other planets in that spatial region have made similar claims. As specified in the Essential Guide to Alien Species, humans were a highly evolved race possessed of advanced mental capacity, physical hardiness, and adaptability to sudden environmental alterations. While these traits were by no means exclusive to them, they were still considered fairly extraordinary by the galactic standard, which allowed humans to become the most numerous and politically dominant species in the known galaxy, to the point where they were often considered to be the standard by which the biology, psychology, and culture of other species were compared. And as I've said many times in the past, you're free to debate the ethics of that mindset in whichever way you deem appropriate. In terms of overall health, Mara maintained a slender but athletic figure throughout her entire life, her extensive combat training helping her to maintain the physique of a top-tier fighter. While the Jedi Master's initial instruction did stem from the dark side of the Force, which has been known to degrade one's physical capabilities and radically alter their appearance, Jade was never shown suffering from these effects, her scars being more psychological in nature rather than physiological, and even those were eventually healed when she fell in love with Luke. That being said, even Mara herself has admitted that she was saddled with the naturally degenerative effects brought on by old age and a lifetime of battle. Though if her final duels are any indication, it's also pretty clear that the naturally sustaining power of the light side of the Force has gone a very long way to mitigate this. She may not be in her physical prime, but she's not even close to frail. Starting as always with Force-enhanced strength, Mara doesn't have too many feats to her name, as she has been noted on numerous occasions to be more of a speed specialist rather than a strength-based one. But that doesn't mean that the ones she does have are anything to brush aside. She has casually kicked fully armed stormtroopers into unconsciousness, beat down the saber defenses of the dark Jedi Alima Rar, and sent the powerful Yuzhan Vong Praetorian Noma Nor reeling with a single uppercut. By the way, this isn't relevant to the analysis at all, but as I was researching, I realized that Noma Nor and I are almost exactly the same size. Crazy. Don't worry, I'm not secretly a Yuzhan Vong infiltrator in an Ooglis skin suit. 
as far as you know anyway. Okay, cheesy jokes aside, Mara Jade Skywalker's most notable strength displays, and you'll hear me say this frequently in this video, took place during her final duels with Lumaya and Darth Kytus on Coruscant and Kavan, respectively. While unable to outright overpower either of her foes, the Jedi Master was able to grapple with them without instantly losing ground, and even managing to bowl over Lumaya and break Darth Kytus' leg with a force-enhanced scissor kick strike. Though, admittedly, the former feat is a bit of a dud since Lumaya's legs were overladen with solid durasteel, a factor Jade strangely didn't consider until after her mouth was filled with blood. As I mentioned in my last few Versus videos, Lumaya and Darth Kytus are both capable of bolstering themselves to the point where they could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Grandmaster Luke and severely injure him. Now, just as with Jaina Solo, I am not saying that Mara's Force-enhanced strength is in any way equal to Luke's. But given that she did as well against the Sith Lords as she did, I think it's safe to say that she is, at the very least, in the Grand Master range for this category. Moving into speed, this is where we really find Mara Jade's specialty. She had no trouble deflecting or evading blaster fire, and she has both intercepted and dodged bolts of Force Lightning from high-tier combatants on multiple occasions. Circling back to the Lumaya and Kytus fights, while Mara was clearly not blitzing her former co-worker and nephew in any way, shape, or form, keeping an extended pace with two of the most powerful Sith Lords of all time isn't exactly what I would call a low-tier showing. For stamina, Mara was still extremely viable even in her old age. Like many of her fellow masters, she has been frequently depicted taking long and prolonged battlefield engagements, and she has also demonstrated the ability to hold down high-intensity lightsaber duels with top-tier combatants for incredibly long stretches of time. Her final duel on Kavan alone taking up an entire chapter in the Legacy of the Force Sacrifice. As far as durability went, Mara may not appear like she could take a lot of damage, but the truth is exactly opposite. She has withstood smashing her head into Lumaya's quite literal steel jaw, a burst of force lightning in the chest from Jeruis Sabayoth, and even being telekinetically blasted into solid stone walls and pillars by Darth Kytus. In regards to her ability to process and deal with pain in the heat of battle, Mara may not have been quite at the same level as her nephew, but endurance training was a very big part of her role as the Emperor's Hand. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, Mara's attempted scissor kick strike on Lumaya's metal body did result in serious physical injury. However, the book also notes that she was so deep into her battle mindset that she basically felt nothing. In fact, it wasn't until the aforementioned headbutt that Mara finally admits to feeling pain, which really speaks volumes about her mental fortitude. Moving into equipment, while Mara Jade Skywalker has worn many different outfits and wielded many different kinds of weapons throughout her life, I am operating under the assumption that she is armed with the same kit that she had during her final battle with Darth Kytus, since that of course was the one she had at the time of her death. In keeping with her assassin roots, Mara wore a sleeveless, form-fitting black bodysuit specifically designed to allow full freedom of movement. Though it lacked the protective gloves, forearm plating, and shoulder pauldrons of her Imperial-era outfit, her boots did retain the shin guards to minimize mild lower impact. Like most masters, Skywalker also wore a brown Jedi utility belt which carried the standard loadout of a comlink, a rebreather, and sustenance capsules. That being said, she did customize her belt with a blaster holster for all those times close quarters fighting was either not an option or not necessary. Speaking of killing tools, let's move into weaponry. Although Mara was trained in the use of basically every firearm known to force, her go-to was that of a heavy blaster pistol. 
As the name implies, heavy blaster pistols functioned much the same as the standard variant with a presumed 50 shots per round capacity, except it utilized a higher powered gas chamber that produced larger, more damaging bolts of energy with a wider beam. The result? was a trade-off. On the one hand, heavy blaster pistols did not stay charged for nearly as long due to them sucking up more juice, but on the other, the damage output was considerably greater. And if you want a visual representation of what I'm talking about, I recommend re-watching Han Solo's interaction with Greedo in Episode 4. Getting more personal, Mara also carried a vibroblade which was basically a large knife outfitted with ultrasonic vibration technology to increase its cutting effectiveness. While some have been known to outfit their vibroblades with cortosis weave in order to enable them to parry lightsabers, there is no indication that the Jedi Master's personal shiv possessed such enhancement. Last but not least, we have Mara Jade Skywalker's lightsabers. Yes, I said lightsabers plural because she was actually wielding two at the time of her death. Interestingly enough, both of these weapons were not constructed by her, but by other members of the Skywalker clan. Her primary saber was constructed during the Clone Wars by her father-in-law, the legendary Jedi Knight Anakin Skywalker, and bequeathed to her by Luke following the end of the Thrawn campaign. Easily the most iconic lightsaber in the franchise, Anakin's slash Mara's weapon followed the traditional single-bladed model, yet was designed specifically for maximum power. Its thick, ridged hand grip enhancing its endurance and accommodating their heavy-handed fighting styles. Although this particular lightsaber did not feature the dual phase mechanism the Chosen One would later adopt as Darth Vader, it did feature a bifurcating ignition pulse that allowed it to function underwater, enhancing its versatility. Mara eventually constructed her own purple-bladed lightsaber upon completing her Jedi training. However, she would still continue to use Anakin's blade on and off throughout the decades, its blue shine being directly referenced in Sacrifice, and its design being directly featured on the cover art for the same book. The weapon was powered by a set of blue Ilum crystals, which were known to produce blades with excellent handling, yet no special properties beyond the norm. Mara's secondary saber was Luke Skywalker's lightsaber Shoto, which the Grand Master constructed shortly after the Battle of Endor and gave to his wife before she embarked on her quest to destroy Lumaya. Simple yet elegant, Luke slash Mara's Shoto followed the same single-bladed model as her primary, yet produced an energy blade that only extended about half a meter as opposed to the usual full meter. Though this feature obviously diminished the weapon's range, the shorter blade did allow for easier concealment and a greater span of motion. Additionally, when wielded in the offhand alongside a standard-sized saber, the Shoto served as a highly effective counter to the Light Whip, the primary weapon of Lumaya, as its dual nature enabled the user to tie up the whip's energy strands without running the risk of leaving themselves open to counterattack. The Shoto was powered by a set of red crystals, and while their exact makeup is unknown, it is my personal belief that they are of synthetic origin due to Luke literally throwing it together in an afternoon with limited resources. While synthetic crystals have been known to be capable of producing energy blades with cutting power enough to potentially break the blade of standard lightsabers, this was only when they were infused with the power of the dark side of the Force. Which, considering we are talking about a weapon made by Luke Skywalker, I really don't think was the case. Cade Skywalker was a human male, and therefore possessed almost the exact same biological makeup as Mara Jade Skywalker, the only real difference being his gender. While his exact age has never been specified, given his appearance and by the fact that he was noted to have been almost ready for his trials when Osis fell, I think it's reasonable to assume that he was somewhere in his early to mid-twenties by the end of the comic, and therefore still well into his physical prime. His continuous combat training and battle experience crafting him into, and I quote, the Sith's worst nightmare. 
Addressing his level of physical health, Cade is actually in far better shape than he has any right to be. During his seven-year stint as a bounty hunter, Skywalker became addicted to death sticks, which was a mild hallucinogenic drug which, when taken in mass quantities, was known to shorten the user's lifespan and even suppress their perception of the Force. However, due to his insanely powerful healing abilities, which we'll get to later, Cade was able to circumvent these side effects, basically allowing him to get as high as he wanted without the destruction of his own lifespan. Lucky bastard. Additionally, while Cade, much like his great-grandmother Mara, struggled mightily with the dark side for years, he was never immersed in it deeply enough for him to suffer any lasting degenerative effects. The only visible signs of his internal struggle being the yellow eyes he sported when going full rage mode. Moving into his application of force-enhanced strength, Cade was a truly terrifying force to behold. He has casually kicked a solid wood bat into splinters, kicked various aliens into unconsciousness, and even created small craters in the earth with the force of his punches. As far as his fights with other force wielders went, Skywalker has consistently shown the ability to grapple and sustain blade locks with council-level beings like Darth Talon and Darth Nile, the latter of whom he once kicked so hard that the Nagi was sent flying several meters into a stone pillar hard enough to crack it. His most impressive strength displays took place during his two duels with Darth Krayt at the Sith Temple on Coruscant in Legacy Volumes 3 and 11. While overpowered in both instances, Cade was still able to hold his ground against the Emperor for a brief time, and even brace himself against a few of his foe's high-powered strikes. I would just like to remind everyone that Krayt, even while not drawing on the Force, can lift an adult human being off the ground like a paperweight, and when amped up, can literally punch hard enough to puncture Abeloth. Yeah. As is to be expected from a powerful Force wielder with an on-the-run lifestyle, Skywalker was also quite the speed demon. He has dodged blaster fire at point-blank range as though it was just another morning exercise, and he has had zero difficulty reacting to force lightning fired at him by high-tier combatants. During his aforementioned skirmishes at the Sith Temple, Cade was able to speed blitz Darth Talon and take her out of the fight inside one panel. This was quite the accomplishment, considering that the Twi'lek Sith Lord is actually renowned amongst her peers for just how fast she is. Even more impressive was Skywalker's ability to move swiftly enough to finally kill Darth Krayt after the Emperor attempted to convert him to the dark side. While Krayt being caught off guard was obviously a factor in Cade's success, it does still speak well about what the young man is capable of. Moving into stamina, Cade Skywalker's threshold was very impressive even by Jedi standards. Like many of his ancestors before him, he has been frequently depicted taking part in prolonged battle raids, and he was also no stranger to holding down high-intensity lightsaber duels with top-tier combatants for extended periods. Two prime examples being the Battle at the Hidden Temple and the Battle of Coruscant, both of which can be at least inferred to have taken place over the course of several hours. That said, Cade's most impressive stamina feat took place in Legacy Issues 31 and 34, and it really surprises me that so few fans bring it up in the Versus community. During the Battle of Had Abaddon, the former Jedi apprentice turned Imperial Knight Azalin Ray was basically flash-fried by Karnes Murs and Darth Krayt's Force Lightning Clash after she had stabbed the distracted Emperor through the back. Not willing to let her die, Cade summoned his Dark Transfer ability and continuously poured his healing energies into Rey, keeping her alive until they reached his aunt Drew Rock on Kifex, passing out shortly thereafter. While the exact length of time Skywalker spent sustaining Rey's life force is never specified in any source, we do know that Had Abaddon is in the Deep Core and Kifex is in the Inner Rim. That's actually pretty close. In astronomical terms. Alright, so 
Space travel, specifically space travel time, is very inconsistent in Star Wars, to the point where it straight up does not make sense, which is why I think so few creators touch on it in any significant capacity. However, even with that taken into account and the additional variable of the Minoc gunning it, Cade, and this is him after a battle, had to have been doing this for at least an hour or two before he was finally given the opportunity to let up. Mind you, it's not like he was just lifting a pebble with TK or something like that. No, Dark Transfer, like all force healing abilities, drains the user in direct correlation with the severity of the injuries they are healing, and Ray would have literally died had Cade not intervened. So, yeah, um... One of the most impressive stamina feats in all of Legacy, and arguably in the top 15 for the franchise. Neat. As you'd probably expect from someone with such ridiculous stamina, Skywalker's durability was also considerable. He has endured being stabbed through the shoulder with a Sith lightsaber, tanked bursts of force lightning from Darth Malady, and even survived having his own Dark Transfer ability turned against him by Darth Krayt, though admittedly the Dark Lord was holding back. Cade also possessed a very strong capacity for understanding and dealing with pain in the midst of combat and torture. During his time at the Sith Temple, the young Jedi was subjected to the Embrace of Pain, an organic torture device invented by the Yuuzhan Vong. Within its coils, Cade discovered a new definition of pain and suffering. As the device literally read the electrochemical outputs of his nerve impulses in order to inflict a customized agony that operated at both constant and optimum levels. While most sentients couldn't survive the embrace for more than a few minutes, Cade is implied to have held out for hours. And though unconfirmed, it is my personal belief that his noticeable jump in endurance compared to earlier parts of the series was owed directly to this experience. Moving into equipment, Cade Skywalker's loadout was a bit straightforward, but still far from mundane. He has almost always been depicted wearing his Bounty Hunter garb, which was composed of a black sleeveless shirt, black pants, flight gloves, a badass trench coat, and heavy shin guard laden boots. Its most prominent feature was that of a gold and black blast vest, which while not immune to lightsaber blades, did possess a limited ability to withstand blaster bolts. Although not of Jedi design, Skywalker also wore a utility belt which carried all the same gear as Mara's, including the customized gun holster. Shifting into his actual weaponry, Cade carried a customized double-barrel blaster carbine affectionately nicknamed the Rock Chopped Special. Essentially a mini shotgun, the blaster functioned much the same as any other rifle except its dual barrels allowed it to fire, well, two shots at once with a very wide range. Power-wise, the Rock Chop could blow away most non-force wielders with ease and while its exact round capacity is unknown, we can assume that it was at least comparable to the Stormtrooper E-11 rifle, which had a capacity of 100 rounds. The gun was outfitted with a precise user recognition code, meaning that it would only work when wielded by Skywalker unless it was deliberately reprogrammed. Cade Skywalker's most notable tool was his lightsaber, which, just like Mara's, was not initially constructed by him, but by a past member of his family. His primary saber was built in the decades preceding the Sith Imperial War by his father, the powerful Jedi Grandmaster Cole Skywalker, and bequeathed to him by the Vong Shaper Nai Rin after she had recovered it from her friend's body. Simple in design but efficient in performance, the weapon followed the traditional single-bladed model with an average-sized hilt, silver plating, and no special mechanisms. While powered initially by a set of blue crystals of unspecified makeup, the sheer intensity of Cole's final stand would cause them to be charred beyond repair, forcing Nairin to outfit the lightsaber with a set of green lambent crystals in order for Cade to make use of it. 
Referred to by some fans as Vong gems, Lambents were rare crystals harvested by the Yuzhan Vong that produced energy blades of comparable strength to those produced by planets like Ilum. Their main defining feature was that when properly attuned, the crystals could grant the user the ability to sense Yuzhan Vong, a feat that was normally impossible due to the species existing somewhat outside the Force. As I've said before, aside from their respective genders, there are no significant biological variations between Mara Jade Skywalker and Cade Skywalker, which obviously makes sense considering that they are related. Both are as human as one can realistically be, and as such, this verdict will hinge on health, athletic feats, and the benefits of their equipment rather than anatomical makeup. Starting with their levels of fitness, there is no question that these two Jedi were among the most able-bodied fighters of their day. Both have been trained in the Jedi-slash-Sith arts since pretty much day one, and both have fought extensively in a wide variety of settings. In regards to handicaps, while both Skywalkers have experienced brushes with the dark side, neither has delved into it deeply enough to suffer any lasting physical repercussions. Even if we were to assume that they would end up drawing on it in this fight, which isn't guaranteed, the most that would realistically happen would be a slight alteration of eye color or skin pigmentation, which won't affect their battle capabilities in the slightest. That being said, there is a rather sharp contrast at play when we consider time frames. Even if we are being conservative in our estimations, Mara is at least three decades older than Cade. That's the second largest gap in age we have had this season so far, only being beaten out by Kip Duron and Darth Plagueis. While it has been long since established in lore that age degradation is not as severe for human Jedi as it is for human non-Force sensitives, it is still something that needs to be considered. Like it or not, time catches up with everyone eventually, and Mara herself has admitted that her capabilities aren't quite what they used to be. Sure, Cade may have spent months on end getting stoned off death sticks, but as I mentioned in his breakdown, he was explicitly using his force powers to mitigate the damage, so it isn't even that big of a deal in the grand scheme of things. As such, while Mara is comparable, I ultimately lean more towards Cade when it comes to assigning a health edge. Though again, it is basically mainly the age difference. Moving into strength, I would have to consider Cade Skywalker's applications of enhancement to be the more impressive of the two, though it is by no means a stomp. Mara Jade Skywalker is a fucking beast, and despite not being a strength-based fighter, she has repeatedly demonstrated that she can throw hands with the best of them. However, not only is Cade directly credited with higher baseline stats in his character sheet, but his feats of force-enhanced strength are simply more consistent than anything his great-granny has ever demonstrated. Yes, Mara could grapple with Darth Kytus, but grappling with someone is not the same as beating them down. And if Cade can handle Darth Krait's insane strength for even a brief period, then I honestly don't see her bringing anything to the table that he couldn't at least deal with. Speed-wise, I'd say they're roughly on par. While I would give a slight edge to Mara Jade Skywalker due to her noted specialization and superior accolades, Cade Skywalker's feats are so similar that I cannot envision the difference between them being all that massive. There's not going to be any Palpatine-style speed blitzing here. Both can casually dodge blaster bolts, react to force lightning conjured by powerful individuals, and match the saber swiftness of council and even grand master level combatants with only a moderate degree of strain. Stamina is... fairly decisively Cade's game. Although both Skywalkers have shown the ability to wage marathon fights and keep their composure when faced with extremely powerful adepts, Mara's advanced age saddles her with limitations that Cade does not possess. 
Even if we were to fallaciously assume that the Jedi's respective levels of physical conditioning and force energy reserves are dead even, Cade would still be primed to win out against Mara in a pure war of attrition, if by no other reason than by the fact that humans in their 20s and humans in their 50s are built differently. Not only that, but we also have the sheer insanity that is Cade Skywalker's healing of Aslan Ray feet which, even lowballed, far surpasses anything Mara Jade has ever done or been credited with in her old age. And unlike Mace Windu, she does not have any sort of Vopad-like ability that she could fall back on to boost her reserves. So, yeah, like I said, fairly decisive. Comparing their levels of durability is tricky. Regarding native endurance, Mara and Cade have been subjected to many of the same injuries, such as blunt force trauma and force electrocution, and have bounced back from said injuries at a fairly comparable rate. While it can certainly be argued that Mara surpasses Cade in her ability to focus through pain in the heat of battle due to her talents in the area being more fleshed out in lore, I believe that this is counterbalanced by the Jedi Apprentice's ability to completely retain his sanity after extended time wrapped in the embrace of pain. A feat that I think Jade could replicate if given the chance, but not by any means easily. To put it simply, it's a tie. Shifting into the combatant's gear, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that even by NJO standards, these two Skywalkers were packing some serious heat. There are no relevant combative distinctions between their clothes, and both wore utility belts that functioned similarly. That said, Cade Skywalker's blast vest offers protection against Mara Jade Skywalker's unarmed physical attacks and severely reduces the effectiveness of her vibroblade. While I agree that the vest would largely be ineffective against a direct hit from a heavy blaster pistol, since even its protection against standard bolts was limited, some protection is still better than none. Speaking of blasters, although their exact level of power output in relation to each other is likely comparable, I do view Cade's Rock Chop Special as the superior gat to Mara's heavy pistol, partially due to the extra barrel, but mainly because of the user recognition code preventing the Jedi Master from using it against the Crusader should he be somehow disarmed. Moving into their lightsabers, both Mara Jade Skywalker and Cade Skywalker inherited their blades from legendary figures in their clan and have brought honor to them with every use. Mechanically speaking, there was very little that distinguished Anakin slash Mara's saber from Cole slash Cade's, as both followed the standardized single-bladed model. Although Mara's does contain the added feature of the bifurcating ignition pulse, it's not really relevant in a fight that isn't taking place underwater. Similarly, while Cade's lambent emeralds are technically superior to Mara's Ilum sapphires due to their ability to grant him Vong sense, again, that would only be relevant if he was fighting a Yuzhan Vong, or if a Yuzhan Vong was part of the setting for this battle, neither of which are the case. That said, Luke slash Mara's Shoto lightsaber does come with several advantages, not the least of which being its greater range of motion and its ability to be seamlessly paired alongside her primary to enhance her fighting style. Two blades are better than one and all that jazz. At the end of the day, when comparing the physical and tool-based stats of Mara Jade Skywalker to those of Cade Skywalker, what we have is a dynamic that almost directly parallels that of Mara and Darth Kytus during their final battle. There is no question whatsoever that Mara could contend and even potentially take the advantage in specific scenarios. However, Cade has youth on his side, is bigger and stronger, is at least comparable in speed, has significantly higher stamina, can take just as much damage, and while not quite as heavily armed, is more than sufficiently equipped to cover his bases. I award Cade Skywalker the edge in physical capability and equipment.
Following their battle with the dark side Cillian beast on the jungle world of Arolia, Jedi Master Qui-Gon Jinn said the following when asked by his apprentice Obi-Wan Kenobi about the morality of taking a life in situations where no other alternative exists. The ways of the Force are beyond our understanding. Who knows why we were directed to exterminate the beast? Perhaps we were agents of retribution. Perhaps we performed an act of liberation. We cannot know. We can only serve. As a Jedi Knight, you will be called upon to do many things you don't want to do, Obi-Wan. Our path is not an easy one to follow. But fear not. You are in the hands of something far greater and much grander than you can imagine. While all Jedi are bound by a sacred oath to preserve life regardless of form or function, they are equally bound by a sacred oath to protect the innocent at all costs. Killing will always be an act of evil, but there are times when the necessities of duty outweigh personal convictions. To get the job done, sometimes you have to ignite your lightsaber and cut someone's head off and few embodied this ideology as completely as Mara Jade Skywalker. Though loving, she was, by her own admittance, a fighter to her core. Whether as subtle as snake venom or as direct as a charging bull, she would do whatever was necessary to fulfill her objectives, and the only times a body was found was when she allowed it to be. Starting as always with accolades, Mara Jade was an exceptional martial artist, one of the few Force sensitives in the franchise to have attained eminence among both the Jedi and the Sith. As noted by her entry in the official Star Wars fact file, Mara was one of the strongest adepts to have ever served under Palpatine during her tenure as the Emperor's Hand. Now, taken on its own, this accolade is pretty vague, as it does not specify explicitly where the assassin scaled in comparison with the Empire's other notable dark side enforcers like Inquisitor Jarek, Lumaya, or Galen Merrick. All it tells us for sure is that even at her peak, Imperial Era Mara was not as proficient as Darth Vader, as he has been noted more times than I can count to have been second only to his master during his entire reign. That being said, even if Jade was only like number seven on Palpatine's list of his 10 most capable killers, that's still quite the hefty praise considering just how friggin' stacked the Emperor's inner circle was. Heck, even Executor Cedrus, whom Sidious thought of as little more than an errand boy, was still able to briefly swap sabers with Dark Empire-era Luke Skywalker before being overpowered, so it's not like he was recruiting weaklings. Following Palpatine's first death at the Battle of Endor, Mara Jade's fighting prowess atrophied considerably due to much of her physical and force-based strength stemming directly from her connection to her master. This actually turned out to be a blessing in disguise, as not only was she now free to embrace the light side, but she could also rebuild her skill set from the ground up through the ways of the Jedi. As noted by the novels Star Wars The New Jedi Order, Vector Prime, and Force Heretic 2 Refugee, good force, those are some titles, Mara Jade Skywalker was one of the most formidable fighters the NJO ever produced, attaining a level of skill with the lightsaber that was renowned even by groups outside of the Jedi, and while I know this may sound like a no-duh sort of attribute to clarify, it has been confirmed that she grew to be far stronger as a Jedi Master than she ever was as the Emperor's Hand. Even Darth Kytus was not above giving his auntie credit, still referring to her as being a superb assassin, despite his noted superiority in both skill and power. Shifting into feats, Mara Jade Skywalker lived during several of the most tumultuous periods in galactic history, and as both the Emperor's Hand and a senior master of the Jedi High Council, she was forced to do battle with many of the most formidable combatants of the era. During the final act of the Yuuzhan Vong War, 
Mara fought the conniving Vong Praetorian Nomenor and defeated him with very low difficulty despite relying mainly on her unarmed abilities. Now, while this battle was not a contest between two force sensitives and therefore not beholden to the same parameters as this matchup, there are attributes that I think are worth mentioning. Namely, the Vong's inherent capabilities, Nomenor's scaling compared to his people, and the level of ease in which Jade bested her foe. As noted by many sources, the Yuzhan Vong possessed natural strength and durability well beyond the scope of many species, with even the most pitiful among them being shown to be capable of threatening everyday sentience. Their most notable trait was their immunity to practically every manifestation of force-based power, which obviously provided an edge when engaging Jedi. In regards to Nomenor specifically, while he did function as a member of the Intendant caste rather than the Warrior caste, his physical abilities were still noted to be slightly above the rank-and-file members of his race. Don't misunderstand me, he would get eaten alive by Supreme Overlord Shimra, War Master Savang La, or even Anami in a one-on-one -on -one fight, but it's not like engaging him would be an Ujali cakewalk for most people. Despite all this, Mara could still smack around Nomenor like a grandma who had just caught you using naughty words. As I said, Jade rarely employed her lightsaber in this fight, instead opting to use her hands and feet to make the pummeling more personal. The novel even noting that the only reason Anor lasted as long as he did was because of his natural long durability. But in the end, all that did was make him a slightly more resilient punching bag, and there aren't too many Jedi in the universe who can equate a Yuzhan Vong to that. Rewinding back a few years, we have the first of Mara Jade Skywalker's notable feats of combat with other trained Force wielders. Shortly after her admittance to the Jedi Academy on Yavin 4, Mara befriended fellow trainee Corrin Horn, and their bond would strengthen and persist throughout the entirety of their lives. As I mentioned in my Darth Thanaton vs. Corrin Horn matchup, Master Horn was one of the most elite Blades beings the NJO ever produced. Having been skilled enough to best the renowned Vong commander Shado Shai in ritualistic combat, and even match the likes of Cam Solasar, Saba Sebatine, and even a hindered Luke Skywalker in various high-intensity sparring sessions. Mara and Corrin have fought each other many times, not to kill, but to grow, each pushing the other beyond their limits so they can achieve new levels of strength. Huh, a very Dragon Ball-esque. Their most notable bout took place within one of the Coruscant Jedi Temple's many sparring rooms in the novel Star Wars The New Jedi Order Dark Tide II Rune, another amazing title. Blade to blade, the two Jedi Masters were very evenly matched, Mara pitting her acrobatic brawler style against Corrin's jagged Tricata sequences. Both intended to win, and both relied on guile and skill to do it. While Luke Skywalker admitted that he had seen greater displays of the Force and more fluid displays of swordsmanship in his lifetime, which might have been a reference to his father, just saying, he was amazed by the sheer complexity of Mara's and Corrin's battle, particularly when it came to their fluid alternations between attack and defense. This feat was even more remarkable because Skywalker explicitly states that neither combatant was operating at their peak. Mara Jade had yet to fully recover from the disease given to her by Nomenor's Kumbo spores, while Corrin Horn was still recovering from his numerous battles with the Vong on Bimil. Despite these parameters, Mara was still able to compete on Horn's level very effectively, and I think we can all agree that any battle between two weakened fighters that can earn praise from the strongest Jedi Grandmaster in history is nothing to sleep on. Jumping ahead to the Second Galactic Civil War, we have what I, and I'm sure many others, consider to be Mara Jade Skywalker's second most notable display of combative prowess. Shortly after discovering that her old foe Lumaya was alive and threatening her son, 
Mara began a solo campaign to hunt down and kill the powerful Dark Lady once and for all. Though her search was long, the Jedi Master eventually tracked her prey to the moon of Hesperidum where they engaged in a brief battle within the confines of a starship docking station. The battle was vicious, both women relying heavily on their physical might rather than their ethereal prowess to see them through. Although Lumaya's durability and skill with the Light Whip presented a challenge that few Jedi could contend with, Mara displayed a tenacity that would have impressed her father-in-law, even going as far as to injure herself by headbutting the Sith Lady's steel jaw in order to create an opening for her to stab the Sith in the chest with her lightsaber. Lumaya's cybernetic enhancements allowed her to survive the attack, but before the duel could continue, the ancient Sith meditation sphere ship intervened by wrapping a tentacle around Mara's neck and throwing her hard against a nearby wall, blasting the breath from her lungs and allowing the injured Dark Lady to make her escape. Now then, there are several variables we need to acknowledge. First off, in terms of just their pure martial skill, Mara and Lumaya are very clearly on par with each other. They exchange blows at a similar rate and both limped away with a comparable amount of damage. Secondly, while some have argued that Lumaya was holding back from killing Jade to further Jason Solo's fall to the dark side, this is not something that the book even alludes to, nor has it been confirmed in any external sources. It's really only with the benefit of hindsight that the idea of Lumaya sparing Mara for Jason can be speculated, since, as we know, Mara was the one Jason ended up killing to embrace the shadows. But again, it's pretty obvious that Lumaya was not banking exclusively on that exact scenario for her plans to succeed. Personally, I do think Jason would have still ended up becoming Darth Kaidus even if Lumaya had killed Mara. The only real difference is that he probably would have ended up sacrificing Ben or even Alana instead. Thirdly, it is true that Ship's interference ultimately rendered the bout inconclusive. That being said, the Sphere itself later remarks that it chose to act because it did not like the idea of two darknesses fighting each other heavily implying that Mara Jade not only possessed the capability to end Lumaya, but might have done so had the fight kept going. This is extremely impressive, since we are talking about the same Dark Lady of the Sith who has not only defeated a pre-prime Luke Skywalker, but was later able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe against prime Luke Skywalker and actually put up a little resistance before being killed. Last but certainly not least, we have Mara Jade Skywalker's most impressive combative feat and her most controversial one. During the climax of the novel Legacy of the Force Sacrifice, Mara fought her nephew Jason Solo within an underground tunnel system located on the Hapen world of Kavan. This fight is considered by many to be one of the most pivotal confrontations ever to take place in the post-Return of the Jedi era, and it's a statement that I wholeheartedly agree with. Standing but a single step away from fully embracing the dark side, Jason attacked Mara as though the stability of the very universe was on the line, which, from his twisted perspective, was very much the case. Mara, meanwhile, fought with both fury and determination, the fire in her heart blazing with the desire to protect her family from the man before her. Knowing full well the sheer power of her nephew, Mara entered the tunnels ahead of time and familiarized herself with the layout of the area to establish a game plan before using her force presence to lure Jason to her. Solo was fully aware that he was walking into a trap, but his confidence in his strength pushed him forward. This turned out to be a costly assumption as almost immediately after the pseudo-Sith entered the catacombs, Mara burst out of the shadows and shattered his kneecap with a force-enhanced scissor kick strike before sprinting away down the tunnel. Jason cursed himself for his inattention and gave chase. However, this was exactly what his aunt was banking on. As soon as he rounded the corridor, Mara exerted a massive amount of telekinetic energy 
and buried Jason under a mountain of rubble she had previously loosened. The Jedi Master walked towards the pile and aimed her blaster at her nephew's bloody head, thinking it was over. She was dead wrong. Jason blasted away the stones encasing him, reactivated his lightsaber, and charged. The fight was bestial, both combatants eschewing grace in favor of raw brutality, using almost every technique and weapon they had at their disposal with the sole purpose of burying their foe where they stood. While the two were fairly evenly matched, Jason's prior injuries had weakened him considerably, eventually draining him to the point where the Jedi Master had him pinned down ready to plunge both Shoto and Vibroblade into his chest. Realizing he was about to die, the young man played on the one weakness he knew Mara couldn't fully suppress for a battle. Her love for her son. As her weapons came down, Jason stared directly into Mara's eyes and conjured the illusion of Ben Skywalker's face over his own. Mara hesitated. Jason reacted, jamming a poison dart into her leg and quickly getting to his feet. The toxin took effect almost immediately. Jason looked down at his dying aunt and thanked her for being the one to complete his Sith ascendancy. Scoffing, Mara stated that Jason was like Palpatine. Just cruel, manipulative, and dangerous. Her final words were evident when she told him that Luke would be the one to defeat him and bring an end to his evil intentions. Finally, after one last utterance of her son's name, the Jedi Master passed into the Force. Mara Jade Skywalker and Jason Solo died that day, and Darth Kytus was born. Alright, so as I think my description made clear, there are quite a few variables surrounding this fight. Firstly, Mara Jade cannot defeat Jason Solo in a straight-up lightsaber duel, and she knew this before the fight even started. It is heavily implied by the novel's narrative framing, and even outright confirmed in external material like the Insider magazines. Even if we were to push those aside for whatever reason, Luke Skywalker is stated many times to be the best fighter in the NJO, which of course includes Mara. While Kaidus may not have defeated Luke when they fought in the Inferno novel, he still gave him one hell of a run for his money, so there is little reason to assume Mara is superior. Our second variable centers around the Jedi Master's prep time and environmental usage. As mentioned, Mara initiated her fight with Jason after she had garnered a detailed understanding of the battlefield and set up strategies specifically designed to weaken him. Though a brilliant display of tactical ingenuity, it does sadly reinforce the notion that Mara is not Jason's match on equal footing. Yes, the Jedi Master ultimately overpowered him, but that was only after she had surreptitiously shattered his knee and crushed the rest of his body under tons of rubble. And even then, it's not like Jason didn't make her work for it. This bleeds nicely into our final variable, which is the logistics of Mara Jade Skywalker's defeat. Now, I used to ramble on about how the whole illusion of Ben poison dart stab thing discredited Kaidus' victory, but having re-examined this fight with a more developed perspective, my previous condemnations have been severely reduced. Expecting a fair fight with a Sith is like expecting a pleasant date night with an Anzadi. It's not impossible, but it's not something you should consistently anticipate. Jason's killing of Mara was a cheater's win. But seeing as Mara had to cheat quite a bit herself to even get to that point, it's hard for me not to see where he's coming from. Jason was going to die, and he did what he had to do to survive. It wasn't very elegant, but it was effective. Overall, while Mara did ultimately lose her fight with Darth Kytus, and there were various parameters at play that influenced her performance, the fact that she was able to threaten him in any capacity is still extremely impressive, and really goes to show why she was held in such high esteem by so many factions. 
Moving into technique and attributes, Mara Jade Skywalker was one of the most dangerous individuals to ever brandish a lightsaber. Possessing a broad skill set that was cultivated through years of dynamic training and intense battle experience. As noted by her entry in the Jedi Academy training manual, Skywalker's primary martial arts discipline was Ataru. Developed in the days of the Old Republic, Ataru was the fourth of the traditional seven Jedi combat styles and was generally regarded as the most aggressive among them due to its focus on acrobatics. As explained by the Jedi Path, the mechanics of Ataru were all about dynamic full-body spins and slashes, as well as the precise integration of force-enhanced physical combat techniques. The art also offered training in dual weapon usage, something that Jade took full advantage of. Due to the form's high-octane nature, it was best employed in short, calculated bursts, enabling the practitioner to engage their foes without burning through their stamina too quickly. Additionally, while this is a bit of supposition on my part, I am of the opinion that Mara Jade was also a master of the Three Rings of Defense, as it was the foundational style taught at Luke's Jedi Academy during the time of her enrollment. Essentially a hybrid of the strong, medium, and fast styles featured in the Dark Forces series, the Three Rings of Defense was a simplistic tutorial style designed to introduce the students of the Jedi Academy to the principles of lightsaber combat. The main difference obviously being that it functioned as a multi-layered singular style rather than three separate ones. As Corrin Horn described in the novel I, Jedi, the form consisted of three sets of unique stances and maneuvers that dealt with dueling at various ranges. The outer ring consisting of grand sweeping power attacks, the middle ring rapid short strikes used to intercept projectiles, and the inner ring tight conservative blocks to shunt aside and repost against an enemy's attacks. In regards to alternative combat training, Mara was noted to have received unarmed lessons from the Imperial Red Guards, suggesting that she was instructed in the Ichani arts, which, structurally speaking, we know very little about, but if those red robes are any indication, it's clearly not something you want to mess with. Shifting into her actual means of battle, Mara Jade Skywalker's offensive technique was completely devoid of compromise. Just as a well-trained assassin will utilize whatever tool or tactic they need to get the job done, Mara will adopt whatever fighting method she needs in order to bring her enemies down. While swordplay was a significant component in her makeup like it was for all Jedi, if she could win a fight by slitting your throat with her vibroblade while your back was turned, TK pinching an artery in your brain, or just straight up shooting you in the face with her pistol, she would. This sort of subversive style made her dangerously unpredictable, particularly when one considers her many years of experience. As far as her pure saber attacks went, Mara's assaults have been frequently described as consisting of whipping slashes and stabs delivered at odd and opposing angles in order to keep her targets off balance. She was also capable of adopting a more heavy-handed De Gem so esque attack pattern to beat down an opponent's guard when she deemed it necessary. Though it is worth noting that she displayed a noticeable loss of precision when doing so. In keeping with Ataru norms, the Jedi Master frequently reinforced her saber sequences with integrated physical combat, having a particular preference for flying kicks and close-range jabs. That said, she was also adept at pairing off her physical attacks with her force abilities, telekinesis often being her go-to. While Imperial assassination training obviously leans heavily into the offensive side of things, Mara Jade did not let her defensive capabilities go to rot. When confronted by shooters, she would utilize a set of rapid swipes clearly derived from the middle ring to bat away energy bolts, and when confronted by other trained lightsaber duelists, she relied heavily on Ataru-style evasions to sidestep incoming strikes and leave her prime to deliver devastating counters. Moving into strategic prowess, 
As strange as this may sound, I would describe Mara Jade Skywalker's mindset as a blend of the Jedi spy master Thalm and the ancient Sith Lord Darth Malgus. More specifically, the strengths of the latter and the weaknesses of the former. On the one hand, you have the assassin. Silent. Focused. Cold. A being who analyzes her targets beforehand and meticulously places them in unwinnable situations before executing them on the spot. On the other hand, you have the fighter. Determined. Ruthless. Hot. A being who relies on their passions to fuel them and strives to tear apart their prey regardless of the possible dangers to themselves. This merging of two radically contrasting worlds represented the innate polarity of Mara Jade Skywalker's character. Despite being a proud woman who presented herself as stern and detached, Mara was actually a very compassionate individual. It's just that she was very choosy when it came to letting her guard down, saving face and all that. Think of her almost like a slightly more hardened Ayla Sakura. She's not going to trust you right out of the gate, and it's going to take some time to earn it. But once she sees the goodness in you, her loyalty will be unbounded. This intense loyalty is no more clearly demonstrated than in her relationship with Luke Skywalker. Jade tried to kill Luke at first, but once he helped her see the light, she realized that her life of constant conflict had not provided her with everything she needed. She dedicated herself to the Jedi and, through her experiences and relationship with Skywalker, finally came to acknowledge her love for him and understand the sanctity of life. Circling back to battle, when engaged in either group or one-on-one -on -one combat, Mara was as meticulous as she was intense. She never bothered with the usual Sith boasting, nor was she very keen on the utilization of Dune Moke-style verbal warfare. In her own words, Amateurs gave speeches. Professionals got on with the job. In keeping with this emphasis on practicality, Mara, like Thulm, was at her best when given prep time. Assessing her environment before her foes could, leaving deliberate openings in her defenses to lure them in, and then incrementally striking from the shadows in order to whittle them down rather than engaging them head on. Again, pulling straight from the Bordock's mouth, Trap, immobilize, kill. All that being said, this mindset was very much a double-edged saber. Like Darth Malgus, Mara was known to struggle when she was dropped into fights cold against foes who were actually strong enough to challenge her. While by no means incapable of thinking on her feet, Jade's aggression has frequently led her into either overextending or developing tactical tunnel vision. And if her fights with Lumaya and Jason demonstrate anything, it is just how vulnerable she is against her very own tactics. As in both instances, she was tripped up by an environmental slash capability factor that she failed to take into account beforehand. However, it's not like the list of beings who could do that to her was extensive. As I mentioned previously, one of the harsh realities of being a Jedi is that sooner or later, you will be forced to do something that goes against your personal ethics to serve the greater good. Just as there is no light side without the existence of the dark side, there is no order without the existence of chaos. While a being can choose between following the currents of life or fighting them, there will never come a time when they can choose to escape them because to do so would be to choose one's own non-existence. Everybody, be they Jedi, Sith, or something else entirely, has a destiny that will eventually catch up to them whether they like it or not. We take what is given, and few have lived a life that has embodied this ideology as completely as Cade Skywalker. While a good man to his core, he was never anything less than a warrior. His displays on both the battlefield and single combat being just as brutal as they were stylish. Despite his, shall we say, less than refined methodology, 
Cade Skywalker was a prodigious martial artist. His drive to protect those he held dear and uncommon natural talent leading him to be viewed by many fans as something of a Jedi Crusader, despite never being referred to as such by name in the main legacy series. In regards to accolades, Skywalker doesn't actually have much going for him, at least in terms of direct comparative evaluations of his lightsaber skills. Force abilities is very much the opposite, but we'll get there later. That being said, it's not like acclaims were absent entirely. Two weeks into Cade's retraining within the runes of the Osis Temple, Jedi Master Wolf Sazen remarked that it would not take long for his former pupil to regain form and focus, signifying that the young man possessed an innate level of saber skill that even seven years of absence couldn't squelch entirely. And this is less than a quarter of the way through the story. Shifting into feats, Cade Skywalker was the primary protagonist of the Star Wars Legacy series, and as such was forced to do battle with almost every single major Force-sensitive character that was featured in the comic's seven-year run. His first notable foe was Darth Talon, who served as both one of Darth Krayt's hands and Cade's teacher during his month-plus stint at the Sith Temple. The two fought each other many times in a variety of settings, and though initially a struggle, Skywalker quickly grew strong enough to where he could dispatch the evil Twi'lek with little difficulty, even going as far as to one-shot her during their second battle at the aforementioned Sith Temple, and leave her looking like this a year later at the very same location. Now, the level of impressiveness you can ascribe to these showings is, I imagine, somewhat fluid to many as the community's perception of Darth Talon's strength seems to fluctuate a fair bit even to this day. Speaking for myself, I've always viewed her as being fairly formidable. Not on the Grand Master tier by any means, but I do think she could give some low-tier council masters a fair run for their credits. Remember, we are talking about the same Talon who is confirmed by her entry in the Legacy Campaign Guide to be one of the most formidable lightsaber duelists in the entire One Sith Order, and has displayed skill enough to decimate high-ranking Imperial Knights, hold her own against Shado Veo, and even contend with fellow hand Darth Nile. So it's not like she's easy pickings for most people. Speaking of the nefarious Nagi, Cade's next high-level opponent was well, Darth Nile, their first duel taking place on the forest world of Vendaxia, and their second within the throne room of the Sith Temple. Technically, there's a third encounter sandwiched between those two that also occurred on Coruscant, but I don't really count it as an authentic combative feat, since all it was was Nile blindsiding Cade with a forced choke while his attention was focused on Talon. I guess attacking Skywalkers while their backs are turned is just a thing with this guy. Starting with the Vendaxia fight, Cade, despite not having picked up a lightsaber for the past seven years, was able to contend with Darth Nile very effectively, scoffing at the Sith Lord's attempts to undermine his mental state with the whole I killed your weakling father villain spiel, and disabling him long enough for he and his allies to make their escape. That being said, Cade did have some form of assistance throughout a good portion of the fight, meaning that it is debatable whether or not he would have performed as well had he just gone at the Nagi one-on-one -on -one with no strings attached. Cade Skywalker's and Darth Nile's second engagement two volumes later at the Sith Temple was much more straightforward. Following Darth Krayt's brutal execution of the Jedi healer Hosk Trilus, Cade was very nearly driven into the dark side of the Force out of sheer hatred of the Sith. However, just as his rage was about to reach a crescendo, Cade was visited by the Force spirit of his father, Cole, who urged his son to open his heart and guided him into using his unique powers offensively. His aura surging and his eyes a blazing yellow, Cade obliterated the trans steel case that housed his father's lightsaber before quickly calling the weapon to his hand and impaling Talon. Darth Nile was the next to attempt to stop him, and the two began to fight. While the hand remained a threat, 
Cade Skywalker had grown skilled enough to blunt the effectiveness of the Sith Lord's unorthodox fighting style and gradually push him back. Frustrated, Niall landed a brutal backhand to the side of his foe's head. An ordinary man would have been unconscious. Skywalker just got angry. In a flash, Cade hacked off Darth Niall's right arm at the elbow and kicked him hard enough to send the Sith flying several meters into a stone pillar, cracking it. As Cade loomed over his beaten foe with force lightning crackling around his hands, Darth Crate urged him to finish the job, citing the role Darth Niall played in the murder of Cole and the maiming of Wolf, and how claiming his vengeance would make him strong. Cade refused. When the furious Emperor demanded to know why, Skywalker simply responded with, Because you want me to. Which might, unironically, be one of my favorite comeback lines in all of Star Wars. Now then, I've already explained the parameters surrounding the Vindaxia duel, and there really isn't much to dissect regarding the Coruscant engagement beyond maybe the fact that Cade received a power amp after Cole appeared to him, yet still had to work a bit to take Niall down. Regarding the level of impressiveness, Niall's scaling in the community, like with Talon, seems to vary depending on who you ask. I've seen people claim that Niall could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Anakin Skywalker, and I've seen people claim he would struggle to keep up with Qui-Gon Jinn. Once again, speaking for myself, I'd definitely place Darth Niall on the low to mid council level in terms of overall capability. His victory over Cole Skywalker may have been a fluke, as I explained in my last video, but it is undeniable that this guy can school non-council Jedi Masters like Wolf Sazen without too much difficulty. So Cade's ability to thrash him as cleanly and brutally as he did is nothing to sleep on. Jumping ahead a few months, we have a unique feat to say the least, but not one that lacks content. Throughout Legacy, Cade would periodically engage in conversations with the Force ghost of his ancestor Luke Skywalker, even though these conversations typically boiled down to Luke trying to convince his great-grandson to get his shit together, and said great-grandson being as stubborn as a reek. Although there are several of these interactions, the main one we will be focusing on took place in Legacy Issue 39. After taking up shelter within the abandoned Lars moisture farm to escape a sandstorm, Cade Skywalker would be visited by his ancestor in his dreams, the dingy ruins he had fallen asleep in being replaced by the lively homestead we saw in A New Hope. Though calm and collected as ever, Luke was much more upfront with his descendant than he had been previously, reflecting that he too lost family to the Sith and the Empire, before warning him that he was still skirting closer to the dark side, and needed to move on with his life if he ever wanted to get anywhere. Cade's response to this friendly bit of advice was to draw his lightsaber and lunge. Now, I don't know if I'm in the minority on this, but I've always considered Cade's fight with Luke to be one of the most cinematic duels in the comic, as despite only being two to three pages in length, it perfectly encapsulates who these two Skywalkers are at this point in their existence. Luke fights defensively almost the entire time, intercepting Cade's blade with his own or opting to evade strikes altogether. Cade, meanwhile, is the aggressor, slashing wildly at Luke and pushing him back, but making little progress in the grand scheme of things. The battle ends when Luke puts away his saber and reminds his wayward descendant that even if he tried running from his destiny, the galaxy would never leave him alone. He tells him that there is always more to lose, while a vision of a horrid future plays out within the young man's mind. Luke's words finally break through to Cade, and just like that, the dream ends. Alright, so as I said, this fight is rather unique and does have several variables. Firstly, the whole thing was a dream. Like Yoda and Sidious' fight in TCW, Cade and Luke never actually duked it out in the physical realm. Understandable, considering one of them was dead. Secondly, Luke was never in any real danger of losing. Due to being a Force ghost and operating within a dream realm, he essentially had invincibility and quick save on at the same time, meaning that even if Cade was stronger, it really wouldn't have mattered. 
Yes, there is a precedence for spirits being incapacitated, but that's only ever been shown happening with Sith spirits, which are fundamentally different from Jedi spirits. Thirdly, we need to consider the intentions and mental states of the combatants. Cade was fighting to vent his frustrations while Luke was fighting to prove a point. Neither Skywalker went into this dream expecting a confrontation. Well, Luke probably was, since Force ghosts aren't bound by the limitations of moral perception, but Cade definitely wasn't. Branching out from this is the fact that Luke purposefully resigned from the fight in order to show Cade the error of his ways, so there was no winner in the traditional sense. All that being said, I still believe there are aspects of this feat that are worth praising. Cade may have had no way of defeating Luke, but the fact that he could stand up to him and that this was even a remote contest speaks volumes about the Crusaders' potential, if nothing else. I'm not saying that Cade is Luke's equal. In fact, I think if you were to pit a peak Cade against an alive peak Luke, Cade would get thrashed. All I'm saying is fighting Luke Skywalker's Spectre and lasting longer than a plank instant is not a feat I believe too many other Jedi could lay claim to. Last up, we have both Cade Skywalker's most impressive combative feats and his most controversial ones. During the peak and climax of the Second Imperial Civil War, or the Second Rebellion if you prefer, Cade would face off against the primary antagonist of the Legacy series, Darth Krayt, each of their duels taking place atop the Sith Temple on Coruscant in Volumes 3 and 11. Much like Mara's clash with Jason, Cade's duels with Krayt have long been viewed as pivotal confrontations in the vast post-Return of the Jedi era, and again, this is a notion I find difficult to dispute. In each instance, Krayt ripped into Cade as though breaking him would serve as justification for the Emperor's own tortured existence, which, from his warped worldview, was very much what was needed. Meanwhile, Cade fought with passion and unshakable resolve, determined to crush the monster in front of him or die as who he was, rather than the twisted reflection the Sith wanted to turn him into. As I mentioned previously, Cade Skywalker began his first duel with Darth Krayt after refusing his attempts to convert him to the dark side by slaying Darth Nile. The because you want me to declaration being etched into the writings of the Celestials for its epicness. While Skywalker's newly acquired strength allowed him to contend with the Sith Master far more effectively than he would have otherwise, Krayt nevertheless brought him to his knees after a pitched battle. However, before the Dreadlord could make another move, Cade was saved by the timely arrival of his mother, Morgan Cord, who damaged Krayt with a shot from a high-powered energy rifle, giving her son the opening he needed to make his escape. Jumping ahead one year to Volume 11, Cade Skywalker and Darth Krayt would have a rematch atop the Sith Temple during the Alliance's attempt to liberate Coruscant. As both had grown far stronger since their last engagement, Cade and Krayt's struggle was titanic, both men fully aware that this would be the endgame. As the duo continued to fight while the skies blazed with laser fire, Krayt taunted Cade by telling him that it was due to his own unique dark transfer ability that the Emperor was able to escape death proclaiming that Cade had shown him what it was, while Karnas Mur's spirit had shown him how to manifest and control it. Krayt then proceeded to use Cade's own power against him, forcing him to undergo the same agonizing process of death and rebirth he had gone through, his spirit teetering on the edges of oblivion. Skywalker bore witness to Krayt's vision of the future, which included a Coruscant in flames a shattered rebellion, and Cade becoming his dark side slave, and eventually his host body. When Darth Krayt had finished his speech, he stood up, fully believing that Cade had finally fallen to the dark side and proclaimed him his apprentice. Returned from death, Cade rose and declared that he finally saw what his path was. His eyes were open. He had seen the vision. He understood. There was no more doubts or questions in his soul. He knew his place in the galaxy. 
Then, in an instant, Cade summoned his father's lightsaber and plunged the green blade into the unsuspecting Dark Lord's chest, declaring that he was a Jedi and Krait was not his master. Knowing the depths of Dark Transfer's regenerative abilities, Cade Skywalker gathered the Dread Lord's corpse and flew it into Coruscant's primary sun to ensure no more resurrections. Finally, after over a century of terrifying the universe, Darth Krait was truly dead. Okay, so there are a couple of variables surrounding these showings. While Cade did survive his two big fights with Darth Krait, he didn't really win them. At least not in the sense of directly besting your opponent through superior application of skill and power. In Volume 3, he was brought to his knees and had to be saved by Morgan. In Volume 11, he was overpowered by an unexpected technique and had to resort to trickery. Not only that, but the story makes it pretty clear that in both cases, Krait was making a small effort to keep Skywalker partially alive, whether it be so he could heal the Sith from his Vong infestation or bring him back from the brink of annihilation in order to turn him to the dark side. Additionally, Krait was greatly weakened by his Vong illness during the first bout and powered up to a level beyond anything he had ever been in the second, meaning that you can't view them under the same power level umbrella as some mistakenly do. All that being said, I still believe what Cade Skywalker did in these engagements was absolutely crazy. While he may not have been Krait's equal, he was a definite obstacle for him. These were not fights that the Emperor could coast through in the same manner he had done so many times previously. As I said, Darth Krait was weakened quite a bit in Volume 3, but we mustn't forget that Cade wasn't at the apex of his power either, having yet to refine Shatterpoint and Dark Transfer to their fullest potential. In fact, Krait was drained so severely by his first duel with Skywalker that he needed to be put into stasis almost immediately afterward. And had it not been for the Sith Lord's considerable power and the advanced medical tech of the Legacy Era, he might have died then and there. By that same token, while the admittedly choppy pacing of Cade and Krait's final battle makes it a bit difficult to analyze, we can see quite clearly that the fight began inside of the Emperor's quarters and concluded outside, signifying that the Crusader did put up at least a little resistance before being overpowered. Yes, Krait was holding back a bit, but the fact that he couldn't just flick his wrist and send Cade into near death is not something to be ignored. Especially since the Sith Lord at this point should at the very least rival how he was back at the Lake of Apparitions, which was said to be comparable to a prime Luke Skywalker. Overall, while it is clear that Cade did not defeat Darth Krait in the traditional martial sense in either of their duels due to an abundance of variables, the fact that it was even a possibility, the fact that this was even a contest speaks very well towards the young man's skills, and really puts into perspective Wolf Sazen's comments on Asus about his potential. Moving into technique and attributes, Cade Skywalker was a pure warrior, possessing a dynamic skill set that was cultivated over a lifetime of near-constant conflict. While the Jedi's exact martial discipline is not specified in any source, I am of the opinion that Cade is also a practitioner of Ataru just like his great granny Mara. I believe this for two reasons, those being implicit annotation and character portrayal. Skywalker is directly credited with advanced acrobatic ability in the skills section of his character sheet and has been shown utilizing acrobatics in just about every fight he has been drawn in. Furthermore, he has displayed an immense amount of talent with integrating unarmed fighting sequences into his lightsaber sequences, as well as the use of dual weapon combat. Sound familiar? Shifting into his combat methodology, Cade Skywalker's offensive technique was both aggressive and sketchy as fuck. He almost always went for a killing blow, yet rarely stuck to a consistent pattern. 
Like Mara, his sequences have consisted mainly of rapid-fire slashes and stabs delivered at odd angles in order to keep his targets guessing. The only discernible difference being that Cade appeared to alter more frequently between one- and two-handed grips when adjusting his patterns. Also like Mara, Cade frequently supported his lightsaber sequences with integrated physical combat, having a strong preference for heel kicks and close-range jabs. One area where the two Skywalkers diverged though, and we'll get more into this later, was that Cade was much more liberal with pairing off his physical attacks with his force abilities, utilizing everything from telekinesis to force lightning to dark transfer. Though he operated mainly as an offensive dervish, Cade Skywalker was still more than capable of putting up a strong defense whenever needed. When engaging shooters, he would redirect projectiles back at them as though they were a nuisance, and when fighting other lightsaber duelists, he relied on solid, medium-range blocks backed up with dynamic full-body evasions to dodge incoming strikes and leave himself positioned to deliver offensive counters. While a young, not fully trained Jedi turned bounty hunter turned galactic crusader with a former drug problem doesn't necessarily sound like the most tactically viable of designations, Cade Skywalker was actually rather clever. Due to his father holding strong regard for familial ties, Cade was instructed from an early age on the exploits of his ancestors, studying their deeds and gaining an in-depth understanding of how they survived in a galaxy infected by war. These lessons would serve as both a benefit and a hindrance to the young Jedi after Osis fell, as he was able to use what he had learned to better survive the galactic underworld, as well as justification for running away from his destiny. This struggle between rejection and acceptance represented the core of Cade Skywalker's character. Despite being an abrasive man who presented himself as not giving a damn about anyone else, this was just a front to mask his pain. He cared deeply about his family and friends, his father Cole and his main love interest Delia Blue foremost among them. Like his ancestor Anakin, Cade was reckless, headstrong, and often led by his emotions. But like his other ancestor Luke, he was also compassionate, brave, and unshakable in his resolve. Burning, yet warm. Aggressive, yet controlled. Dark, yet light. The Crusader walked a fragile line between these two extremes for many years before ultimately deciding to blend aspects of both and be his own man. He still had a hell of a temper, but when it finally came time to pick a side between good and evil, he chose good and he stuck to it. Circling back to battle, when engaged in either a lightsaber duel or a street brawl, Cade was as intense as he was precise. In stark contrast to Mara Jade, who rarely engaged in verbal warfare, Cade just doesn't know when to shut up, constantly needling his opponents with taunts, quips, and proclamations of their defeat. We are literally talking about a guy who said, you'll die as some mindless Vong growth to the evil emperor of the galaxy with a grin, okay? He doesn't give a damn. Just as a competent bounty hunter will do whatever it takes to get the job done, Cade will employ whatever strategy he has to to win regardless of how crazy it may be. In his own words, I'm a fast learner and I make things up as I go. As I'm sure you can imagine, this whole fly-by-the-seat-of-your-pants mentality came with both its benefits and its detriments. On the one hand, his general flexibility made it much easier for him to adapt his strategies on the fly in the heat of combat and keep his opponents from predicting his moves. On the other hand, his general lack of preparation also meant that if he was ever confronted by an opponent who was just as strong, but far more sound-minded, he could be forced on the back foot and left scrambling. That said, it's not like pushing him to that point was an easy thing to do for most people. This conclusion is tricky for a number of reasons. As odd as it may sound, from a mechanical standpoint, Mara Jade Skywalker and Cade Skywalker were simultaneously very similar and drastically different martial artists, utilizing high-intensity acrobatic fighting styles, but with noticeably diverging mentalities. 
Starting with a comparison of their feats, I would say that the two Jedi are almost dead even in terms of impressiveness. There is no doubt in my mind that either Darth Talon or Darth Nile would eat No Menorah alive in a one-on-one -on -one fight, but by that same token, I do think the Sith hands would lose to Corrin Horn, albeit not easily. As far as high-end showings go, we know that Luke Skywalker is stronger than Lumaya. Though, again, not by an insane margin, as the two have traded wins and losses time and again. Prime Darth Kytus versus Prime Darth Krait is an incredibly difficult matchup that I don't feel like giving a direct answer on at this moment, due to the sheer abundance of variables surrounding it. However, I will say that I do consider the two Sith Lords to be very much on the same level each having reached that very exclusive Sidious tier of dark side ability. All that being said, despite this near match in general impressiveness, the reason I consider Mara and Cade's feats to be almost dead even rather than fully dead even is because there is a very small differential in the level of difficulty they displayed when engaging their foes. Let's just jump straight into the big ones. Mara versus Lumaya and Kaitis and Cade versus Luke and Crate. Now, Mara may have been possibly on the verge of ending Lumaya before ship's interference, but the story makes it clear that the contest could have gone either way. Ship's later comments confirming that it would have still interfered had Mara been the one about to be stabbed rather than Lumaya. By contrast, while Luke was never in any real danger of being destroyed by Cade and ultimately resigned from the fight, the Crusader was still able to put up a mild resistance before backing down. It was not a wrist flick scenario. Think of it like a level 8 going blow for blow with another level 8 as compared to a level 8 standing its ground against a level 10. Yes, the former is more of a close contest, but the latter is still very notable due to the opponent's caliber. I don't know if I explained that in the best way, but basically what I'm saying is that while Mara's performance against Lumaya is more impressive than Cade's performance against Luke from a technical perspective, I still view the two feats as being roughly equivalent in their impressiveness since Luke is a stronger combatant than Lumaya. If Cade had just been one-shotted by Luke, we would be having a different conversation, but that's not what happened. In fact, I am under no force illusions that if you were to swap Mara and Cade's positions in these fights, the outcomes would have still been more or less the same. A similar dynamic is at play with their other high-tier feats, though this one is more positively skewed in Cade's direction. Mara Jade Skywalker and Cade Skywalker cannot defeat Darth Kytus or Darth Krait in one-on-one -on -one fights. This is something that the lore makes abundantly clear. However, it is also indisputable that both Jedi were able to put up considerable resistance and damage their foes. Both lost to varying degrees, but neither of them went down easily. They stood small, but real chances of winning. All that being said, there is a marked difference in how each of the Skywalkers entered their duels, which is where that skewing comes in. Mara had more training, weapons, and prep time on her side when she fought Kytus and still lost. This is in marked contrast to Cade, who just kind of walked into Krait's pad with his usual kit and was defeated after a scuffle. Going back to my level analogy, this is basically a case of a level 8 losing to a level 10 with preparation, compared to a level 8 losing to a level 10 without preparation. Yes, the outcome is ultimately the same, but the former does sadly reflect worse on the fighter than the latter does. Some may try to counter this by saying that Cade already had some experience engaging Krait, whereas Mara's bout with Kaitis was one and done. But my rebuttal to that is character relationships. Jade was instrumental in Jason's formative training and fought alongside him several times after his soul-searching escapades during the Swarm War. So it's not unreasonable to assume that she had some idea of what to expect when she entered that cave. 
Furthermore, if Mara didn't have a decent understanding of Kaidus' capabilities, then why has it been stated that she knew beforehand that she couldn't beat her nephew in a straight-up duel? You see what I mean? All in all, while the two are very even in virtually every respect, I do have to side with Cade when it comes to assigning a feet edge simply because his high-end showings are a bit less mired in the mud than Mara's. Is it a differential so small that it could only be viewed through a microscope? Yeah, but even a single snowflake can cause an avalanche. Moving into their raw lightsaber techniques, the two were, again, almost interchangeable, only being separated by a slight application difference. Yes, Mara has received more traditional training than Cade, but I believe that this is counterbalanced by him displaying comparable levels of ability and refinement, implying that the Crusader might have possessed a higher innate martial potential than his great granny ever did. Both Skywalkers utilized highly acrobatic fighting styles with a strong focus on physical integration and alternative weapon usage. As I mentioned in their respective breakdowns, Mara has been known to occasionally adopt a heavy-handed De Gem So-esque attack pattern to beat down her opponent's guard, while Cade tended to alter more frequently between one- and two-handed grips when adjusting his patterns. Although these differences are worth pointing out, their actual impact on this match is minimal. What isn't minimal is their relative displays of martial force ability integration. Both have displayed a similar level of finesse with integrating their ethereal talents, but Cade has showcased a noticeably wider range. Mixing in TK, Lightning, and Dark Transfer into his Saber sequences, whereas Mara usually just stuck with TK. The final lap of our pod race is the Skywalkers' respective degrees of tactical prowess. Personal philosophies have little to no bearing in a fight, so I won't bother comparing them. However, I will say that Mara and Cade's struggles with personal identity are striking in their similarity, which is something the comic even alludes to during their conversation in the Osis Temple runes. Both are survivors who will employ whatever strategy it takes to win, regardless of fairness or the danger to themselves. Does it matter what they have to do to kill you? What matters is that they do it. Now, in terms of just raw intelligence, I would have to place Mara above Cade. Though, similarly to Episode 1, Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan, the difference between them is more a difference of experience and maturity rather than ability. When he has his head in the game and a clear goal to be met, Cade can be fairly intuitive, adjusting his strategies to confuse opponents, taking advantage of environmental factors, or even just doing shit that's so crazy that no one would expect it. He's not very subtle, but that's what makes him so dangerous. You can't predict his moves because even he doesn't know what he's going to do next until he does it. However, like Episode 1 Obi, Cade is still impulsive and reckless to the point of near obliviousness. And while he is without question far more experienced than many other Jedi of his generation, he still has some ways to go before fully coming into his own as a planner. By contrast, Mara, like Qui-Gon Jinn, has experience on her side. Both are hotheads who have made some very stupid decisions and are vulnerable to their own tricks, but Jade has simply demonstrated a degree of tactical refinement that I don't think Cade has achieved yet. Does he have the potential to get there? Absolutely. I would even argue that Mara herself is a decent example of what a hypothetical 57-year-old Jedi Master Cade would be like. Still, as it stands, he's not bringing anything to the table tactically that his great-grandmother can't at least roll with. On the whole, when it comes to their abilities as martial artists, Mara Jade Skywalker and Cade Skywalker create what is debatably one of the most even-keel paradigms we've ever had this season. Their lightsaber techniques are virtually interchangeable. Cade has an edge in feats, but only by the skin of his teeth, and Mara has an edge in tactical prowess, but again, only by the skin of her teeth. Usually I wouldn't say I like treating these comparisons as a numbers game, but as it stands, the variances are so minute that I can't imagine them providing a decisive edge in this matchup. No edge will be given for martial arts skill and combative strategy.
Though virtually nothing has ever been revealed about her bloodline and she was only a Skywalker in name, Mara Jade was a masterful force wielder who stood amongst the relatively few Jedi in galactic history to have journeyed through both the light and dark sides in equal measure. Like many of the unfortunate souls that were indoctrinated into the Emperor's inner circle, she spent the majority of her formative years as a living weapon, and even after joining the good guys, continued to develop her powers with an assassin's mentality, focusing on the arts of stealth, deceit, and assassination above all else. While this hyper-specialization did leave Jade's ethereal talents a bit less versatile than many of her peers, it did not make her any less dangerous. Starting with just her pure strength in the Force, numerous sources have credited Mara Jade Skywalker as one of the most powerful adepts of both the Imperial Era and the post-Return of the Jedi Era. Having been recognized by powerhouses such as Darth Sidious and Luke Skywalker for her extraordinary potential. Although the Jedi Master's exact power scaling in comparison to her peers in the Empire and the NJO is a bit vague, I think that there is enough information available for us to make an educated guess. Scribbled within the pages of the official Starships and Vehicles collection, Issue 63 is a passage covering the power of Palpatine's Force-sensitive underlings that reads as follows. None would be trained sufficiently to be a threat to Darth Bane's insistence that there be only two Sith, nor would they be a threat to Darth Sidious or his apprentice, Darth Vader. The most powerful of these agents were only Sith adepts, but would appear almost as Dark Jedi, the likes of Asajj Ventress, Mara Jade Skywalker, or Inquisitor Valen Draco, in fact a fallen Jedi. The lesser agents were reduced to still deadly faceless minions. Among their ranks were the Shadow Guard. Now, I know what I'm about to say is going to sound like a stretch, because it is, but just roll with me for a minute. Due to the specific use of the word powerful rather than, say, skilled or effective when referring to the examples of Palpatine's dark agents, it can be implied that Asajj Ventress, Emperor's Hand Mara Jade, and Inquisitor Valen Draco were all at least similar in terms of raw force power. You could probably already see where I'm going with this. Given Asajj Ventress's ability to stand her ground against Anakin Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi late into the Clone Wars, as well as the confirmed fact that Mara was much stronger as a Jedi Master than she ever had been as Emperor's Hand, you could make the case that Mara's Force strength was comparable to that of early to mid Revenge of the Sith Anakin and Obi-Wan. Yeah. A similar dynamic is at play with her post-Return of the Jedi material. While Mara's standing in comparison to her fellow Council Masters is not specified, she has been referred to as Luke Skywalker's most powerful supporter and ally during the Jedi fracturing period of the Yuuzhan Vong War. On the one hand, this could mean that she was the most loyal to his faction, but on the other could also imply that she was more powerful than all the other Jedi who supported Luke at the time. This includes beings like Saba Sebatin, Kornhorn, and Kyle Katarn. Yeah. Now, as I said, these are both stretches when it comes to scaling Mara's power, and I 100% understand if some or even most of you don't buy into it. Still, given the context of her accolades and everything we have seen from her as a character, placing her power level at around early to mid Revenge of the Sith Anakin and Obi-Wan tier is not all that unreasonable to me. Late Revenge of the Sith slash Mustafar Anakin and Obi-Wan is a different argument, but we're not here to discuss that. Furthermore, it has been confirmed both directly from her and indirectly via others that Mara was not as powerful as her husband or her oldest nephew, both possessing considerably more control, understanding, and range than she could ever hope to. Still, if that's who you need to be put up against to find your cap, you're not exactly low tier. 
Moving into her direct abilities, Mara was an expert in the field of physical augmentation. Using the famed Curado Salva technique to sustain her body following traumatic injury and boost her performance level to the point where she could keep up with Grandmaster level fighters like Lumaya and Darth Kytus. Shifting into the realm of telekinesis, I would describe Mara as Darth Vader light, i.e., she tended to alternate between either a direct application of her power to crush her enemies into paste and subtle manipulations of energy to break a target down bit by bit. Even in a calm state, her basic force blasts could dissipate mid-level force phantoms and sweep away half a dozen armed Corsac agents like leaves in the wind. When engaged in combat, Mara could become rather devastating. During her battle with Kytus, she unleashed a telekinetic wave that was powerful enough to completely collapse one of Kavan's underground tunnels, burying her nephew in heaps of rubble. That said, this feat was directly noted to be a massive exertion for her, suggesting that she might have possessed difficulties expediently manipulating large-scale objects. Jade was also a skilled user of Force Throw, hurling her lightsaber into an adversary's chest or pummeling them senseless with loose objects, a notable example being when she bombarded Kytus with multiple bricks during their fight. One of the Jedi Master's signature telekinetic abilities was Force Crush, which I'd be willing to bet credits was one of the first lessons Palpatine taught to her. During the Dark Nest Crisis, Mara was able to casually squash a Killick assassin like a, a bug, and while the description is vague, we do know that she also employed the technique against Kytus, presumably as a way of damaging his organs. Furthermore, while Jade has never been depicted killing someone by crushing an artery in their brain, given her, shall we say, detailed description of the methodology, I think we can put two and two together fairly easily. In regards to her ability to penetrate the force defenses of other adepts, Mara was skilled, but not without her limitations. As while she was noted to have exchanged force pushes of unknown effectiveness with Darth Kytus, she was unsuccessful in her attempt to force pull her nephew's saber from his grasp despite his many injuries. Similarly, while Mara has been shown to be capable of conjuring effective force barriers, her defenses buckled and ultimately broke under the strain of Darth Kytus's sheer might. Though, considering this is Kytus we're talking about, I wouldn't exactly call that an anti-feat. As one would likely expect from a Jedi trained specifically to infiltrate, Mara Jade Skywalker was an extremely gifted telepath. She had no difficulty manipulating the perceptions of the weak-willed with the mind trick ability, nor has she struggled to project her thoughts across vast distances with the long-distance communication technique. The Jedi Master was also a high-tier practitioner of battle melds, which allowed her to synchronize her mind with her forceful allies to improve tactical coordination, very useful in hectic engagements. She would later refine this power into the inwardly directed ability known as Battle Mind. Essentially an inversion of the famous Jedi Battle Meditation, Battle Mind allowed Jade to drastically boost her own morale in fighting spirit in the midst of combat, no doubt contributing to her ability to bounce back from severe injury. As shown on many an occasion throughout the lore, Master Skywalker was deeply attuned to the powers of Farsight and Force Empathy, frequently catching glimpses into the future, as well as attuning herself to other sentiences' emotional dispositions in order to gain a broader insight. Mara's last and most impressive telepathic ability was her immunity to fear effects and mental interference. This immunity was most keenly expressed in the novel The Last Command, wherein she remarks that Palpatine had taught her force mental patterns potent enough to hide her thoughts from Darth Vader. Whether or not this passage was in reference to Vader's passive force probing or his active assaults is unspecified, but either way, it is still an extremely impressive achievement given that Vader has invaded the minds of powerful Jedi on more than one occasion. Next up, we have the Sense Branch, which, in my view, is tied with Concealment for being the area where Mara possessed the most skill. 
In addition to perceiving the presence and intentions of sentience in her direct vicinity, the Jedi Master could project her awareness across entire star systems with zero difficulties. That said, pinnacle stealth techniques like the Art of Small were beyond her ability to overcome. Mara's signature sense talent was Danger Sense, which, as the name suggests, enabled her to detect hostile actions before they happened to avoid jeopardy. Though specialization does not always equate to ability, there is no question in my mind that Jade's capacity for threat recognition was beyond anyone else in her era. In fact, despite admitting inferiority in raw power, the Jedi Master has claimed multiple times that her danger sense was superior to that of her husband's, a notion that Luke has never even attempted to challenge. Think about that for a second. Mara Jade Skywalker's sensing prowess fed directly into her supremely advanced stealth-based abilities. Basic force concealment was about as easy for her to pull off as blinking, and while unconfirmed, her training under Palpatine does suggest that she might have possessed an understanding of Quatech meditation, an ability famously used by Count Dooku that enabled a darksider to mask their signatures and appear completely benevolent to even Jedi. Getting even more advanced, Mara would learn the art of small technique from her son Ben shortly after he was instructed in the art by Kytus. Essentially the pinnacle of all Force Stealth powers, the Art of Small allowed users to minimize their aura so completely that they could become virtually invisible to the Force. This was a very difficult ability to master, Mara herself only being able to maintain the vanishment for minutes at a time upon initial introduction. That said, the Jedi Master quickly progressed to the point where she could sustain the power for as long as she needed even hiding her presence from Darth Kytus during their final duel. No easy feat, as I'm sure we all know by now. Though not a committed Jedi medic in the same vein as her fellow counselor Silgal, Mara has been shown using the Force to mend the blaster wounds of allies, flushing out poison from her blood, and entering into advanced healing trances to regenerate from otherwise debilitating injuries. Shifting into the realm of energy-based powers, Mara Jade Skywalker was capable of conjuring and manipulating Force Lightning, a rarity among the Jedi as a whole, though admittedly a bit less so in her era as she has pointed out. In terms of effectiveness, Jade's blue lightning was powerful enough to incapacitate high night level adepts like Alim Arar rather easily, implying that she could at least threaten higher tier fighters with the ability as well, despite never being shown doing so. On the defensive side of energy manipulation, Mara was an implicit practitioner of Tuta Minis and a confirmed user of Force Stasis. Also known as Force Absorption, Tuta Minis allowed the caster to deflect, channel, or outright dispel potentially harmful energy surges. Though never referred to by name, Mara likely showcased an advanced application of this ability when she blocked Darth Kytus' attempts to paralyze her spine with a force jolt. Force stasis was basically the same principle, but in reverse. An advanced variant of the basic force stun technique, force stasis allowed the caster to nullify a target's ability to move, speak, or even feel the world around them by overloading their nervous system with pure force energy. While it is true that the Jedi Master has never displayed the ability to stasis lock another trained force wielder, I do consider such feats to be well within her scope. Last but certainly not least, Mara Jade Skywalker was among the precious few to have mastered the ability to transcend the physical plane as a force spirit, which allowed her to maintain her individuality after death and manifest herself as an immortal, semi-tangible light side entity. Though this power obviously has no significant combative uses, it speaks incredibly well towards Mara's level of force understanding as even attempting the spiritual training necessary to achieve the sacred state has always been considered a sign of extraordinary ability. It also comes in handy when one's descendants are acting stupid.
With the blood of Vader and Luke coursing through his veins, Cade Skywalker was an inferno in the Force, who somehow embodied yet also stood outside of the usual mystic perceptions attributed to his family. Drawing on both alignments of the universal energy field with fervor, yet manifesting his powers in ways all his own. As I mentioned in his Marshall breakdown, Cade was forced to adopt a crusader's mentality due to the unfortunate circumstances of his era, and his approach to the Force was no exception. As there was little peace to be had, there was little peace to be practiced, and as a result, his powers were quick, direct, and awe-inspiring in their magnitude, his time with the Sith adding an aggressive edge to his displays. Cade's skill set may not have been the broadest due to his relative ignorance of the higher mysteries, but if you needed someone to dish out some justice to the bad guys, there aren't many others who were as qualified. Addressing his raw power level, Cade has been noted throughout the Legacy comics and their tie-in material to be immensely strong in the Force, existing as a focal point of destiny whether he wanted to or not. While there aren't any notable examples of direct scaling regarding Skywalker's power, we can examine who he has received praise from and how to make an educated guess. On the Jedi side, Ghost Luke Skywalker, Kakruk, and Wolf Sazen have all referred to Cade as a very powerful individual. Not exactly unweighted claims, as anyone who knows anything about those three masters can tell you. Similar assertions have been made on the Sith side by Ghost Karnes Mur, Darth Krayt, and Darth Talon, all three of which the Crusader defeated to various degrees, so again, not exactly weightless. Looking at it purely as is, I would say that Cade Skywalker at his peak was probably the second or third most powerful non-divine force wielder of his era, with the only beings exceeding his level being post-resurrection Darth Krayt, who blatantly overpowered him, and possibly his father, Cole Skywalker. For more info, see this video, links in the description. And, you know, kind of like Mara and Luke, if that's who you need to be set against, you're not exactly a pushover. Moving into his abilities, Cade, like many of his caliber, was highly adept at using Kirado Salva techniques to re-energize his body and boost his performance level, having a particular penchant for speed that itself was sufficient enough to contend with Council and Grandmaster level adepts like Darth Talon and Darth Krayt. As far as telekinesis goes, Cade Skywalker was, again, very similar to his great-grandmother Mara in both form and usage, alternating between direct applications of power intended to obliterate and precise manipulations intended to dismantle, the only notable difference being frequency of usage, but we'll get to that shortly. Even as early as the third volume of the story, his basic force blasts could rip apart sheet metal, and, by the end, could sunder the reinforced stone floors of the Sith Temple like they were paper. Although the Crusader has never been depicted conjuring a Force wave to sweep away mass quantities of assailants, considering that Darth Krayt, even as a Jedi Padawan, could pull off such feats, I have very little reason to doubt that he could do the same if the need arose. Two of Cade's most frequently used TK abilities were Force Throw and Force Pull, pelting his foes with every loose object he could wrap his mind around, as well as ripping their weapons from their grasp. Getting a bit more brutal, Cade learned how to use the Force Choke technique during his time at the Sith Temple, allowing him to conjure what has been described as an invisible hand around a being's windpipe to throttle them into submission. Who has he used this on? Oh, uh, you know, just his half-sister and his mother. Sadly, not the worst feud this family has ever had. Speaking of common familial actions, Cade Skywalker was extremely proficient at ripping through the Force defenses of other adepts. Having blasted away the elite Imperial Knights Antares Draco and Ganner Craig, as well as low council-level fighters such as Shado Veo and Darth Talon. He also broke through the barrier of the Old Republic Jedi Master Celest Moore while she was empowered by the spirit of the Sith Karnes Mur, easily a low Grand Master level feat in my opinion. 
That being said, when it came to defense, Cade was a bit more hit and miss. The aforementioned Shadow, Talon, and more having all TK'd him at various points in his development. While the Crusader did eventually level up to the point where he could conjure shields powerful enough to withstand massive explosions and deflect blasts from the hand Darth Strife, reborn Darth Krayt was still able to hurl him back in their final battle. Though considering that the same could be said for about 99% of the verse, I'm not really that critical. Moving on, Cade Skywalker was a surprisingly skilled and versatile telepath given his relatively limited training. Using mind tricks was basically effortless for him, and he has showcased a solid understanding of the animal bond's power, successfully taming the mind of a wild claw bird and using it to fly him towards his captured friends. Getting more advanced, Cade, despite his fairly vocal disdain for visions, was not exempt from inheriting Cole's renowned sensitivity to farsight, though it is implied that his capabilities with the power were comparatively lacking. Conversely, Cade Skywalker has also been shown to have inherited Mara Skywalker's immunity to fear effects, but to a much higher degree. Whether a byproduct of his heritage, willpower, or both, Cade's ability to resist mental interference was debatably top 10 in the franchise, and I'm not even kidding. At the climax of the Vector arc, Skywalker became one of only two individuals to have ever fully resisted the effects of the Mur talisman, literally scoffing at Mur's attempts to possess him before obliterating the Dark Spirit. Did I mention that it's been implied narratively that even a pre-prime Darth Vader wouldn't have been able to do that? Three volumes later, Cade would again demonstrate incredible mental fortitude by resisting Darth Maladai's memory walk technique and turning the effects back onto her. This was then quickly followed up by the Crusader using memory rub to forcibly rip every single secret the Sith Lord had learned on Wayland from her mind and drive her temporarily mad. Cade displayed a similar feat during his final battle with Darth Krayt. Seeing but not succumbing to the visions of a possible future the Emperor was projecting into his head in an attempt to lure him to the dark side. Easily a Grandmaster tier feat. As I'm sure many of you would expect from a being with such crazy telepathy, Cade's sense branch based abilities were well developed even if they weren't god tier. Like most Jedi, he could feel the presence and states of mind of those around him be they Force-sensitive or otherwise, and discern their characteristics such as mood, consciousness, and intent. That being said, it has been shown that his perceptions could be fooled by Force concealment abilities so long as they were being used by a sufficiently powerful adept like Darth Talon. Keeping with the topic of Force Concealment, the Crusader successfully masked his aura from Shadow Veo with an unknown variant during his Osis retraining, a decent feat giving Veo's strength. Although Cade, like Mara, did not enter into the Jedi Academy intent on being a healer, his capacity for knitting bone, mending flesh, and renewing the energy of others was on a level virtually unheard of in galactic history. It's literally one of the story's central plot points. Most of this fame revolved around his dark transfer, but I'm going to save that until the end and strictly focus on the Crusader's other restorative talents for the time being. Why? Logistics. In addition to the healing properties of the control branch, Dark Transfer also incorporated the alter attributes of Force Lightning and the sense-based elements of Shatterpoint into its makeup, effectively making it a hybrid power. As such, it makes the most sense to me to analyze Cade's capabilities with the building blocks of Dark Transfer before moving into the technique itself. Does everyone understand? Okay, good, let's move on. Though rarely seen, Cade has shown no strain in applying the basic force healing ability to mend wounds in himself or others, even being able to ease a sentient's passing into death should they be beyond his ability to save. During his initial imprisonment in the Sith Temple, Skywalker used poison detoxification to continuously purge his system of the Lexital Clonia injected into his system by Darth Malady, a feat the Sith Lord found depressive since her torture session had been going on for an entire day by that point. 
The arguable pinnacle of the Jedi's conventional healing abilities was his use of hibernation trances, an advanced meditative state where all bodily functions were slowed to a crawl. Described by the Jedi Path as the most extreme application of the healing arts, Cade slipped into the hibernation state at the conclusions of both the Osis Massacre and the Battle of Coruscant, holding out for days as his body drifted through space inside his flight suit. As far as his skills with energy manipulation went, Cade Skywalker followed his clan's lead by being a highly prolific user of Force Lightning. Potency-wise, Cade's blue lightning was powerful enough to instantly KO an armored Sith trooper and is implied to be a threat to Darth Nile's life. Considering that the Sith Troopers, as I discussed in my Cole video, can be scaled to Master level, and we've already established Darth Nile as a low to mid Council level fighter, I don't think it's a stretch to assume that the Crusader could shock higher tier beings if the need arose. Furthermore, while presented in an incredibly vague manner, some fans have taken Cade's depictions and dialogue during his time on Kifex to suggest that he could also manipulate natural lightning from the environment around him. In fairness, this is not an unprecedented occurrence. Alter environment is a definitive subcategory of Force study. But as I said, the artwork and dialogue are pretty vague, so I'm hesitant to rule one way or another. Up next, we have Cade Skywalker's second most exotic force power, an extremely complex technique that few among even his clan could use, the Shatterpoint ability. One of the few high-level powers that was accessible to both alignments of the universe, Shatterpoint granted the user an acute insight into metaphysical fault lines perceived through the force, allowing them to see points of vulnerability, importance, or curiosity. This principle applies both in a direct sense in combat with another being, as well as the ability to literally shatter seemingly unbreakable objects with a single tap. Though extremely difficult to do, certain practitioners such as Mace Windu could elevate their perceptions beyond the physical realm and perceive various metaphysical insights. Insights like those observed within the cause and effect of given actions the weight of a decision, the meaning of a path leading to a specific event, the importance of an individual, or even where the person in question literally breaks. While his degree of foreknowledge is debatable, Cade first became aware of his ability to perceive shatter points when he brought Master Sazen back from the brink of death. The Crusader would later describe his perceptions in Volume 3 as akin to seeing a network of red lines spread throughout someone's body that he can follow and manipulate. As mentioned in his Marshall section, Cade was initially only capable of seeing shatter points until the specter of his father showed him how to apply the ability on a physical level, breaking apart trans steel on his first go. That being said, despite his considerable talent, Skywalker has never showcased the ability to apply Shatterpoint on a deep metaphysical level. Lastly, we come to Cade Skywalker's ultimate power, an application of the Force that was, for a time, unique only to him, and, as mentioned, served as one of the central plot elements of the entire Legacy series, Dark Transfer. Also known by the fan-coined term Shatterpoint Healing, Dark Transfer was a hybrid ability that combined elements of Force Healing, Force Lightning, and Shatterpoint. Though classified as a dark side aligned power in the campaign guide and associated with such in the comic, the power was not exclusive to evildoers. As Skywalker demonstrated on at least two occasions, Dark Transfer could be used in conjunction with the light side of the Force if the practitioner draws from feelings of love and peace rather than hatred and aggression. This positive methodology actually produced greater results than its shadowy counterpart and less of a stamina drain. Functionally speaking, Think of Dark Transfer's healing properties as almost like an upgraded version of Tsunade's Creation Rebirth Jutsu from the Naruto series. By mixing Shatterpoint's internal perception with Force Lightning's energy channeling and Force Healing's precision, a user could essentially pour the Force into someone or something's internal structure and repair it on a cellular level. 
However, unlike Tsunade's power, there didn't seem to be many limitations in what Master Dark Transfer could heal. Cade has regenerated from lightsaber punctures, cancelled out the effects of Vong Coral Seeds, and even cured himself of the Rakagul Plague, which, mind you, was explicitly engineered by Karnes Murr to be uncurable. Cade Skywalker's most notable healing use of Dark Transfer was his ability to revive someone from the threshold of death. Now, just so we're clear, Cade cannot raise the dead. However, it has been shown that if a being still has a flicker of life energy within them, he can bring them back, or at the very least keep them alive long enough for them to receive medical treatment, as was the case with Azalin Ray. Unsurprisingly, such insane regenerative properties made Dark Transfer a fairly viable defensive ability. That being said, healing was not the power's only possible usage. Just as how taking away a single ingredient can turn medicine into a poison, Dark Transfer could become devastating if the user willingly dials down the healing elements and ramps up the lightning and shattering. To use another anime reference, consider it like an upgraded version of Law from One Piece's Gamma Knife technique. By overtaxing the areas where the shatter points intersect with an excess of energy, a user can destroy either a person or an object from the inside out. This can be applied both from direct manipulation or an exacerbation of injuries previously sustained. As Cade himself puts it, I can see where a being is weak or broken. I can pour the force into those breaks just enough to heal, or I can tear you apart. In terms of effectiveness, Skywalker has threatened to dismantle Shado Veo with offensive dark transfer, and a few volumes prior nearly did so to Darth Talon. The Jedi's most impressive display occurred at the Vector Arc's climax when he utterly destroyed the Mur Talisman, one of the most powerful Sith artifacts to ever exist. All that craziness aside, Cade's Dark Transfer was not the most powerful force ability in the verse, nor did it lack limitations. Firstly, the power's sheer complexity required considerable energy to be maintained, making it rather draining to a user's stamina. While light side practitioners could mitigate this weakness due to their inherent mental stability, it was still far from a perfect solution. Secondly, like most force abilities, it is possible for a wielder of Dark Transfer to dispel the effects of another wielder of Dark Transfer if there is a significant gap in power, skill, or both. Lastly, Dark Transfer could only be used on another individual if the practitioner was in direct physical contact with them. It's not like telekinesis. Cade can't just summon a ball of Dark Transfer energy and chuck it at someone. He needs to actually touch what he wants to mend or destroy to initiate the circuit, much like basic force healing. Still though, as far as cost to benefit ratios go, there's definitely worse out there. And now we have reached the final leg of our journey, my friends. While the distribution of edges is not even, Given that no advantage was awarded for martial arts training slash combat strategy, and Cade was only given the physical slash equipment edge on a minor technicality, this makes force abilities the deciding factor, and therefore I shall be proceeding directly into the final verdict. As users of the force, Mara Jade Skywalker and Cade Skywalker existed in very similar spheres. Both possessed tremendous power as well as a propensity towards both light and dark side teachings. They were good people, but they did not limit themselves to a single way of thinking, using whatever technique they believed would serve their goals best. If that meant occasionally raising the eyebrows of a few of their peers, so be it. That said, when it came to their respective ethereal specializations and how said specializations impacted their combative prowess, the two Skywalkers were noticeably different. I've said it many times before, and I'll say it again. Mara is an assassin, Cade is a crusader. Mara is the Jedi who will use her powers to slip behind enemy lines to slit the general's throat in their sleep. Cade is the Jedi who will use his powers to obliterate the whole damn army while shouting, is that all you got? 
Although I do not view either school of thought as inherently superior to the other, we need to remember the parameters of this matchup. This is a contest of pure forcibility where the combatants are being dropped in cold with neither prep time nor environmental advantage. When viewed through those constraints, a disparity does arise, one that Darth Kytus has even alluded to. Starting off with just their power levels, while the exact scaling of both Skywalkers is difficult to pin down, I would have to consider Cade as the superior of Mara in terms of his raw Force connection. Even if my theory of Jade being comparable to early Revenge of the Sith Obi-Wan and Anakin is 100% on the credits, Cade has been narratively scaled around blatantly stronger beings like Darth Krayt, and, more to the point, has demonstrated a greater level of magnitude on a more consistent basis. That being said, the power gap is not astronomical. If Mara can even remotely threaten Darth Kytus, who, for those wondering, I do place above Cade, with her use of the Force, then Cade will not be able to sweep her away like he's done with Talon. Still, if there's a raw power edge to be given, it's pretty clear who should get it, and this feeds directly into the Jedi's respective skill sets. Kirado Salva techniques coincide with physical capability where we have already decided our verdict. Regarding telekinetic prowess, I would say that the dynamic between Mara Jade Skywalker and Cade Skywalker mirrors that of Asajj Ventress and Anakin Skywalker. Broadly speaking, their skill levels with the power are basically equal, as both could call upon it at a moment's notice and use it in a variety of unique ways against powerful opponents. But, as I've said, Cade was way more liberal in his use of TK in battle, and displayed a greater magnitude than Mara on a consistent basis, giving him an edge. Telepathic prowess is… interesting. If we ignore efficiency and just compare variety and refinement, Mara sweeps Cade, no question. Except for memory rub, Cade's mental moveset was pretty typical by Jedi standards. By contrast, Mara possesses several esoteric abilities that greatly expand her range and even directly bolster her combative effectiveness, Battle Mind being the obvious example. Unfortunately, this is a fight, so efficiency does need to be considered, and that's where things sadly fall apart for the Jedi Master. Jade may be one of the most exceptional telepaths of her day, but if Cade can laugh off possession from the Mur Talisman, and even somewhat resist being mindjacked by Darth Krayt, I just don't see her having much success if she attempted similar tactics. That being said, Cade would have no luck influencing Mara either due to her also possessing fear effects resistance. And please don't even try to argue that Mara's mental strength is inferior to Darth Malady's. We're talking about a Jedi who can hide her thoughts from Darth Vader for Force's sake. Overall, Mara's telepathic range gives her the edge on paper, but when Cade's resistance is considered, the factors more or less balance out. Sense, concealment, listening, and transcendent abilities don't have much relevance in a fight that takes place on neutral ground, so I won't really be going into them. Though I will say that Mara Jade Skywalker does take the edge in all four. Granted, that's mostly because the first two realms are literally her specialty, and Cade doesn't even have access to the latter two as far as we know, but hey, you gotta take your victories where you can. While we're on the topic of specialties, there is no doubt that Cade Skywalker holds a sizable advantage over Mara Jade Skywalker in the healing arts. Even discounting the insanity that is Dark Transfer, Cade has displayed proficiency in literally every healing power that Mara has been credited with, and has done so with greater magnitude. It really is just that straightforward. Moving into energy manipulation, I would say that Mara's Force Lightning and Cade's were roughly equivalent in their effectiveness. Both have a dark edge, so there's no real difference in conjuration, and both are implied to be capable of harming individuals of a similar tier. On the defensive front, Mara has her Tutaminus and Force Stun abilities, whereas Cade has… nothing. 
While the portrayal of Mara blocking Kytus' Force Shock is admittedly vague and we have never seen the Jedi Master stunlock another Force Adept, even if her capabilities were only partial, some defense is better than nothing. In regards to how Cade Skywalker's Shatterpoint ability would influence a fight with Mara, well, it continues to be just as OP as it's always been. Even if Cade's aptitude with the exotic force technique didn't quite measure up to someone like Mace Windu, you don't need to reach that level to be effective. Shatterpoint's most basic applications still greatly enhance a user's intuity and allow them to exploit a weakness with precision and blinding speed the moment one is presented. Just as he did with Crate in their first duel, Cade can use this power to perceive the innate fault lines in Mara's being and use that knowledge to exploit fatal flaws to attain victory. While it wouldn't be an easy task due to his great-grandmother's durability and masterful skill, Cade has more than enough experience to dismantle her. Let's be real, if he can obliterate the Mer talisman, rupturing organs is not an unseeable possibility. Finally, we have come to the pinnacle force ability of this verdict, which is, of course, Cade Skywalker's Dark Transfer. And just as how Jaina's Shatterpoint was what solidified her victory against Anakin, this is the power that ultimately tips the Force scales in the Crusader's favor. While by no means unstoppable or bereft of weaknesses, Dark Transfer offers its users considerable defensive and offensive capabilities. Not only can Cade mitigate the massive amounts of physical damage Mara will undoubtedly impose on him, attritional victory, but he can also attack her internally in ways she has no real way of countering if given the opportunity, distinct attributable victory. The technique's energy consumption is still a notable factor, but as I've said, Cade's embrace of the light side does compensate for this issue ever so slightly. He can't keep Dark Transfer going indefinitely, at least not in a battle, but it's not the same as, say, Deadly Sight or Force Storm, where it's literally one or two goes and then you're completely tapped out. Overall, when it comes to their abilities as combative Force wielders, the disparity between Mara Jade Skywalker and Cade Skywalker shared several parallels with the disparity between Mara Jade Skywalker and Darth Kytus. While the two Skywalkers match each other almost beat for beat when it comes to skill and speed, Cade boasts a greater level of raw power and a higher quantity of techniques, many of which provide massive advantages in the field of battle. Mara may be Cade's match as a martial artist, and could definitely overcome him if given prep time, but this is not enough to make up for her clear inferiority when it comes to using the Force. Add in the Crusader's physical slash tech advantages, and there's only one way this can go. The battle between Mara Jade Skywalker and Cade Skywalker would play out much like a combination of Yoda's battle with Darth Sidious in the Senate arena and Galen Merrick's final confrontation with Darth Vader on the Death Star. Specifically, the versions depicted in the Revenge of the Sith and Force Unleashed novelizations respectively written by Matthew Stover and Sean Williams. The fight would begin with an almost Old Western-style standoff, Cade possibly opening with some snarky remark like, I hope you still got this in you, Red, while Mara just stares at him stone-faced, saying nothing. Then, in a flash, the two Jedi would ignite their ancestors' sabers and smash into each other, blue sheets and fans of green sparking through the landscape upon which they fought. The opening salvo would be brutal, both Jedi leaning heavily into Ataru-style sequences to take their opponents down as quickly as possible. Once the Skywalkers settle into a comfortable rhythm, they would begin an epic contest of lethality that could just as easily last minutes as it could hours. Sabers flashing, leaps sidestepped or met with flying kicks, blaster bolts deflected, grapples broken, and punches parried. Realizing that the fight could go on forever if they continued to rely solely on weapons training, Mara and Cade would start making more deliberate use of their force abilities. The flow would remain unchanged at first, but as time wore on, Cade's greater power would begin to take a toll on Mara, just as it had with Kytus. 
In the end, both would be utterly exhausted, but Cade's strength would be less depleted due to him healing himself with Dark Transfer, whereas Mara would just be running on fumes. No longer able to keep up, Mara would be unable to defend herself from Cade, who would take advantage of the opening to stun her and place his hand upon her throat. Unleashing the full intensity of Dark Transfer, Cade would immediately overload Mara's very being with raw energy, resulting in the total annihilation of her internal organs. However, rather than a charred corpse hitting the floor, Mara Jade Skywalker's body would vanish, leaving only her robes and lightsaber behind. Cade would look upon the area where his great-grandmother had just been in confusion until he heard an approving voice speak to him from the netherworld of the Force. You did good, kid. Maybe you're not a complete idiot after all. Flashing a slight grin, Cade would pick up Mara and Anakin Skywalker's lightsaber and clip it to his belt right next to his father's, another reminder of the legacy he bears. I declare Cade Skywalker, the Crusader, the victor. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed this entry in Versus Series Season 7. As always, please leave your thoughts and questions in the comment section below. May the Force be with you, stay safe, and I'll see you guys later.